Okay, guys, in this unit, we're going to go over some interventions for obesity. So uh, one of the most effective ways for patients, uh, maybe who have struggled with weight loss, um, we'll get into some of the um, some of those data in a bit, but uh, is bariatric surgery. So this is uh, the population that I work with specifically. Bariatric surgery is indicated for individuals with BMIs over 40. Um, in most facilities, uh, the average population you're seeing there really, uh, it's a BMI over 50. Um, it's, it's, it will result in a very dramatic um, and often sustained weight, uh, weight loss, uh, more so even than, than medical management. Again, this is really intended for people who have you know, tried weight loss before, were unsuccessful, or if they have serious complications related to their obesity uh, that would not, uh, like that needs, you know, need, you know their, their weight is such a problem for them medically that needs, they need to have pretty immediate intervention to reduce body weight. So these are individuals sometimes awaiting maybe an organ transplant of some kind. Um, they may often get bariatric surgery prior to that um, so that they're able to tolerate or have a successful surgery. So I've seen that uh, clinically as well. Um, now, in terms of the effects, you know, the, the average weight loss people um, should experience about a 61% weight loss, um, of, ex of excess weight loss, and that's compared to a normal BMI. That's how we calculate excessive weight loss um, or, excess, or excess weight, and then they should get to, you know, get close to a normal BMI. So they should see 61% of excess weight lost after surgery. Um, and the majority of that will happen within the first year. Um, and after, you know, two years, especially, they start running the risk of ma maintaining weight regain. So we, we view bariatric surgery as a tool for weight loss. It's not the end all be all. You will lose weight because we'll show you kind of what happens um, to the, the, you know, the GI system with this, uh, with these procedures. But uh, it's just a tool and your body will make adaptations to the surgery over time. So really, patients need to make sure that they're maintaining exercise, maintaining the dietary and the eating behavior changes um, post-operatively to really maximize that one year, year and a half window they have where the effects from surgery are, are at their peak levels and to prevent that weight regain, which we start seeing after two years. Um, but again, bariatric surgery will lose weight. We see resolution of a lot of obesity-related complications, diabetes, hyper, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, obstructive sleep apnea. We see this resolve um, in, a, in a lot, a lot of patients. Um, and again, um, really important that patients still stay active um, and keep keep compliant. Um, the, one of the bigger problems is like only about 10 to 24% of patients after bariatric surgery even meet the, the minimal activity guidelines. And we'll, we'll talk about things we can do for that later on. Uh, here's the procedures uh, that you know, you'll know you see most often used. Uh, this is the RGY or Ruin Y gastric bypass where we will uh, cut um, a, a pouch basically off the stomach or from the stomach, um, making it smaller. Um, and then bypassing a large part of it. Uh, so really you've got, you know, a, a, a tiny little stomach, you're bypassing most of it and then connecting it to the, uh, the small intestines. You're bypassing a large part of the stomach. Uh, that's probably the most effective procedure for weight loss. I mean, you're, you're gonna see pretty dramatic, uh, you know, weight loss with that procedure in particular and probably the, the greatest impact in all those other associated uh, factors like diabetes, like hypertension with this one. Uh, the second most common or other, other most common you'll see is the uh, laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, which is uh, similar to the bypass, that they're kind of cut off a large piece of a stomach um, where, you know, again, we're, just, we're minimizing the size of the stomach. Right? So this physically can't hold as much food. They're not bypassing it like they do with the gastric bypass. Uh, it's just making the stomach smaller. Now, um, quite often, surgeons will start with this procedure because once you do a gastric bypass, you can't like go back to do a sleeve. Um, but you can go from a sleeve to a bypass. So sometimes a patient, again, fails to maintain their weight loss. They may get a revisional surgery. And if they have had a sleeve, or they have an option. If they did a, a gastric bypass from the first, first attempt, there really aren't any other options to them uh, for them as well. Now, uh, we, you may also see lap band procedures 
um, which is not as drastic as a, of a procedure as a bypass or even a sleeve, um, where we in, in, implant an inflatable cuff around the stomach, which just makes people feel a little bit more full. It's, it's a constricting band. You don't see this as often because the effects on weight loss aren't as pronounced as these two procedures here. Um, and if this, you know, depending on the patient, this can get actually cause ischemia to the to the stomach. It can cause you know erosion, which can lead to more complications than um, really even any any benefits. So risk benefits, and then the, the benefits aren't as great as these other procedures. So most facilities, um, you'll see these two. Uh, the one advantage of the lap band is that it's it's a temporary procedure. So some people uh, would get them and get them removed. Um, so you know you don't have these same. Um, you know, you're not stuck with just a, a smaller stomach for the rest of your life. But again, most surgeons won't, won't do the lap bandage because it's just not as effective um, as the other procedures. Now, uh, bariatric surgeries are becoming more common. It's kind of what we talked about it. There's 100,000 bariatric surgeries, or over 100,000 done in the United States annually. It's one of the most frequently performed operations in the entire, all of North America. It's very successful for rapid, uh, rapid weight reduction. Um, and more people can continue to get it every year. At our facility, we have about 1,000 new consultations for bariatric surgery. Our patients go through a six month to a year <clears throat> process where they go through psychological counseling, dietary um, counseling, they see a physical therapist, they work with an internal medicine doctor as well um, for over a period of about a year, um, generally. Every facility is a little bit different, but we, we, we get a thousand new consultations through 500 surgeries or more a year. Uh, so it's, you know, and we're just one facility. Hospital costs for these you know, procedures continue to increase. And it's where we're, we're looking at a lot of um, ways to potentially reduce the risk factors because um, historically this was done with an open abdominal surgery. Now it's done laparoscopically. So there's just four holes made in the, in the abdomen. So that's actually reduced the post-operative complication rate uh, dramatically, where it's it's one of the more safer procedures, um, you know, in in medicine, um, and which is kind of you know rare considering the the populations that that, that get it, because um, patients who are obese that are high risk or high risk anesthesia high risk anesthesiology consultation in general, they're very hard to get off the ventilator, um, but with the you know with the use of laparoscopic surgery and robotic surgery, a lot of those complications are almost negligible. Um, you know, and, 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 and serious complications are very, very rare. But there are some, um, again, the, the complication rate is about 1% while in the hospital, about 3% post-discharge. Uh, and a lot of that, you know, will be hypovolemia. It's probably a big one, dehydration. Um, there may be issues with the wound, right, an infection. Um, and then, you know, different GI diagnosis, um, upset, upset stomachs, issues with diarrhea, um, and it's some vomiting. So it, it, it there are, it's, it, the complications are fairly low, um, but there, there are some. Now, uh, what I find particularly interesting, was kind of a little hint in what we're gonna get cover in the uh, pulmonary section, but if we look at some of the pre-discharge complications, like, look, you know, if we get outside of wound infections and other different issues, like, you know, blood clots and stuff like that, if we look at, you know, ventilator, pneumonias, unplanned intubations to get reintubated. There's some of them more common. Actually, the second most common uh, post-operative complication are respiratory complications. If we, if we exclude wound-related complications, um, respiratory complications are the highest. And again, that's just because obese patients in general are difficult to wean um, from a mechanical ventilator that you'll be on during surgery. Um, and there are some unique changes that happen to the respiratory muscles and to the lungs in these patients. So. Um, again, you know, a lot of our goal with with you know the, with these surgeries is getting patients up and mobile as early as we can to reduce the complication risk, and that's kind of the role of PT from the inpatient standpoint, um, working with these patients. But the, this respiratory complication, um, you know, is particularly interesting, especially considering some of the impacts obesity has on the respiratory muscles. The big one being here, the diaphragm, my favorite muscle. Um, you know, I love this. You know, <clears throat> Pai Mei from Kill Bill here made me ponder, maybe what's going on here with these respiratory complications? So I'll save that for our pulmonary unit. So uh, that was surgical interventions for obesity. And then the uh, last unit will cover our rehabilitation considerations and exercise considerations for the obese patient.